Hello, welcome to the November 23rd, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test, make sure everything is coming through as expected, and we'll get started. Hello, welcome to... Okay, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream, how it works is it is just a question and answer session. So you could ask questions either by submitting an email in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or just by entering your question in the chat field. We'll try to get through all the questions in chronological order as completely and as succinctly as possible. So, but uh, a couple things when asking questions, sometimes it's helpful if you could specify which level of Cubase you're running, whether it's Elements, Artist, or Pro, or whether you are running it on Mac or PC, which version, so is it version 10, 10.5, 10 11? That information is often helpful. Um, I may not be able to get to your question immediately, but if we could try to refrain from asking the same question repeatedly, that would help uh, me get through more questions and kind of speed up the whole process. We will probably have all of the topics covered in the live stream tonight uh, posted uh, with timestamps uh, pinned to the top of the comments field. And if you wanted to search uh, for uh, Club Cubase live stream topics, I think we've done over 14,000 questions. You could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm is kind enough to uh, compile that site for us. Um, so I want to give a special thanks to Jan. Also, some, uh, I want to give special thanks to Jazz Dude and Agent K who do moderation for us. They're not Steinberg employees. They just kind of uh, come directly out of the goodness of their hearts to help out the community. So, and uh, I'm sorry, just had a call coming in. So, uh, and another wonderful resource of Steinberg information, you could go to the Cubase Nation Discord. I know Jazz Dude does that. So special thanks to all those people and everyone for making it such a wonderful community. Um, just a note, uh, I know it's not uh, Thanksgiving throughout the world, but uh, so on Friday, it is a holiday in the United States, so we won't be doing a live stream, but we will be continuing on next Tuesday. So once again, no live stream this upcoming Friday. It's a holiday in the United States. I'm going to try to take a holiday for once. Uh, so we'll kind of be just looking uh, for the particular uh, end of month live stream on the upcoming Tuesday. So we will spend kind of do a shortened live stream starting on, uh, you know, starting Tuesday and then have a Zoom meetup where meet people could actually meet each other. And those are always a lot of fun. So I know people are, look forward to those all the time. But anyway, uh, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, some of the questions. So break away my chat field here. And if you learn a new tip or trick, make sure that you do subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. And also make sure that you hit the thumbs up for a like button. And that allows us to continue doing these live streams. And once again, my name is Greg Undo. I'm a work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. And I'm based in uh, the United States outside of Washington, DC area in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're watching this live stream, uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Okay, so we have a question. Um, hey, Greg, I noticed that when I load an 808 in the sampler track it is not the same. I need uh, uh, the sample is not the same. I need the internal drive and clipper to get close, but still not the sample I loaded in it. What should I do here? So let's go ahead and find, uh, I'll just find maybe kind of different drum samples here. Okay, just let me look for...
All right, so let's say if we're just looking for kick drums. Just. All right, so let's say if I wanted to do this, I'm going to now come over here and create a sampler track. Uh, so once we've done this, I will come over here. All right, so we, that's our sample. So it sounds the same to me. So I'm not sure if where the 808 is coming from, if it's just a sample, but if I preview this, Uh, so sometimes, you know, as people are doing this, you know, depending on where they're previewing for them, if there's additional gain, um, you may have to come over here and there is a normalize function within the sampler track. So sometimes people may have it on a track that has additional gain and processing, uh, but just kind of taking a particular sample here and triggering it seems to be the same uh, on my end, but also make sure if you're clicking here, um, you know, you might be having different velocity levels. So if you hit it from a MIDI keyboard, but it sounds uh, pretty much identical here. So let's say, So I don't notice any like differences in sound that would require it, uh, but make sure that when you do it, you know maybe if you normalize the sample here and make sure that you're, uh, sometimes also if you have the previews gain all the way up, uh, that may affect it. So make sure that your preview gain is at zero dB uh, and then that won't add any gain during the preview process of the samples. So if you give that a try, let us know. All right, so we see a question also in the sampler track. Uh, why does sample track does not accept audio file from inside a project? So if I wanted to just kind of drag and drop uh, the audio into the sampler track here, we can um, just go ahead and trigger directly there. So it could be, um, you know, check to see if you're running it as an admin or not. So try toggling the status of your admin rights, and that could have the effect on dragging and dropping directly into the sampler track. All right, so we see Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas and Robbie Bowling from Dallas. Okay, so we have a question uh, from uh, Stockholm from Benny. Uh, tips on how can my plugins load up faster than they do have a strong computer and a lot of RAM memory, but I think it takes a little too long sometimes using Nuendo 10. Thanks. So, you know, often, you know, as Cubase is loading up, it could really be contingent on how fast, like if you're doing lots of sample libraries that all of the sample libraries, you know, each sampler will load up its own samples uh, and how fast each instrument loads up their samples is contingent upon the instrument. So sometimes people will be running lots and lots of samples in different samplers and those take a while to load up within the samplers and it takes the Cubase uh, project a longer time because it's waiting for the particular instruments to load up. So sometimes, you know, in, if you start, uh, one thing to try, I've, I've seen this online, I think especially, you know, that may have an effect is, you know, as you start is when you first start up, maybe having a uh, higher buffer size for your audio interface may make a difference. I know some people find that if they're exporting audio, if they raise the buffer size uh, before exporting, that that can make a sense. So it may have a similar effect uh, as the project is loading up, 
if the if you have the capability to purge samples basically to you know have the instrument if you're dealing with a lot of sample instruments like in uh how you know i think contact has something similar where basically you could say you know these samples aren't being used in the project so don't load those particular samples up that could speed up your process as well Okay, so we have a question from Robbie Bowling. Greg, what is the best way to set the cursor, I guess, positions? I was dealing with that this morning, and now everything is moving at hyperspeed. I don't know how to fix it. Uh, it elongated everything. So, Robbie, what it sounds like is maybe things got zoomed. So, let's say if I open up this project here. So sometimes if we have stuff kind of zoomed in, I hit play, and I'll just have this activate where it seems like it's going super fast. So try just hitting like G on your computer keyboard and see if you zoom out. Maybe it sounds like it might be just zoomed in really far. <coughs> Excuse me, so if all the Parts are kind of whizzing by too fast. Just try hitting the G key and see if that kind of resolves the issue for you. And then I think it sounds like maybe you got zoomed in, but let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we have Thermonuclear War from Serbia and we have Uno Memento from Finland who's had their first snow today. All right, uh, is there going to be some special offers at Christmas time? Say Wave Lab 11 Elements upgrade to full version for half price. Um, so generally, I, I don't I don't really have the ability to comment on specials before, but you know there might be some stuff coming. You know for a popular sale season that's usually right around this time in the U.S. So you could check that out very soon. All right, so we see Jan from Stockholm, and we see Jazz Dude on the live stream. All right, and we have David from in Wales in the UK. And just he's been immersed in a project in Cubase Artist. All right, and we have Soren in Sweden. All right, so we have a question. When a uh, new version of Cubase is going to be released? So uh, Steinberg has announced that it will be released in uh, 2022. So just kind of keep your ears out for more information in, uh, in the new year. All right, so we have a question. Uh, anyone know when the dongle is going? One less challenge and update would be great. Uh, 10.5 Pro on Mac. So Steinberg has announced that uh, Cubase 12, uh, the next version will not require a dongle. We'll use a new uh, Cubase uh, license management system. So look for Cubase 12 in early next year, and that won't be utilizing the USB e-licensor. All right, and we see David Griffiths giving props to Jan from Stockholm for the Cubase Index well website. So. Well deserved. Thanks, Jan, for providing that. We see Taylor from um, Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay, so we see uh, can more than one dithering option be added to the export queue? So I'm not sure if it's when we do. Um, you know, if we wanted to do the export queue here, so let's say we do our export audio mix down. So if you wanted to do different, uh, you know, sample rates or bit depths, you could just say, okay, I wanted to do my stereo out at 48K. I want to do my stereo out at 44.1K. So we could, you know, have it do its internal dithering to do uh, the sample rate conversion there in the export audio mix down. Uh, but if we have 
uh, different, you know, if it's the point where if you're referring to dithering as uh, employed by the like the UV 22 HR plugin, that this would be contingent on whatever, wherever, wherever this plugin is instantiated in the signal flow. So if we wanted to do our export audio mix down and, you know, we choose to, uh, like when we do multiple, you know, we could choose to have this automatically do them. You know, if we put that plug in on the groups, we could have it applied to the groups, different amounts, or we could have it applied in the master section as well. So let me know if that makes sense, Taylor, for what you want to do, but it's basically, and you could have different instances of the UV22 HR and, and bypass if necessary. All right, so we have Sergo checking in from St. Petersburg. All right, and we have John Costigan who'll be in and out today. Thanks for being a part of the community, John. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Taylor Sapp. Uh, it says, when you enter a chord into the chord track via MIDI input, will the chord maintain the voicing and version that you played? So generally it will pick that up. So let's go ahead and give it a quick test here. So I'll add a chord track. Okay, so I'll just play an F major chord. And let's say I'll invert it where I'll play A, C, and F. So then it's gonna be an F over an A, which is correct. So it will automatically, uh, you know, to the best of its abilities, just kind of come over here. So let's say if I do a C chord, and then let's say I do a C chord with a G in the bass, we'll see that it'll automatically the different inversions will automatically be taken into account. Okay, so you see why are open back headphones recommended for mixing when closed back uh, give better isolation from external noise? So generally, I think a lot of people, you know, open back headphones may interact a little bit more like speakers, so it's not so isolated. Uh, and generally, people, for mixing purposes, prefer for ear fatigue, uh, prefer open back headphones, and often when people recommend kind of uh, closed back headphones, that's for, you know, primarily used, for, uh, recommended for tracking purposes, so that like a backing track won't be bled into uh, a vocal mic when recording the vocal. All right, uh, so we just see from uh, Taylor, did any Cubase 11 updates include triplets on the grid in the editor window? So I think in the MIDI editors that we could do it. So let me just go to a MIDI track. Okay, so what I want to do is to set my grid and um, I want to, let's just, we'll just say we'll set this to quarter note triplet. So now as we see here, the grid can change, uh, the grid line emphasis can change to quarter note triplets or if I do eighth note triplets We'll see eighth note triplets. So whatever the quantized value is set to. So if I go to eighth notes, we'll see that that will change. So you could do that quite easily in the MIDI editors and the sample editor. I don't think it works that way, but the MIDI editors do. All right, we have Trance 202020 from Berkshire, UK. 
All right. Uh, we have a question. Uh, when should ASIO guard be turned on or off or set to high, medium, low? So it could really depend on if you have like a larger project. So generally what ASIO guard allows you to do, and you can set this up in the audio system, is like if we're running at a lower buffer speed. So let's say if I'm running my buffer currently at 256 and I'm only actively recording on a single track, um, I may not have to have the buffer for every track. Let's say I have 32 tracks and I'm only recording on one track. I may not need the buffer to be running at 256K for tracks that aren't uh, going to be recorded on. So what ASIO Guard allows you to do is to run the currently active monitored or record enabled track at the lower latency and to run the other tracks at a higher latency so that we can get more performance. So generally, you know, you know, it's a good idea to have it activated and you can have low and you know, meet normal and high. And these will be just different uh, multiplication values so that you could you know, get more performance when you're working with this. So if it's low, the interval between the record enabled or monitor track versus playback tracks will be closer. And then normal will be a particular factor and a higher factor for high. So, but most of the time, if you just leave it on active and normal, that will give you a significant benefit performance wise on larger projects. And if you need it uh, more CPU, try just to simply move it to high. Uh, so we have a question, is it possible to see a drum map in the in-place editor? So the, the in-place editor is only going to be a setup for, um, you know, for working with the key editor, but a lot of people may not need it as much because we could look at the drum editor in the lower zone and have the two synchronized quite easily, but the in-place editor uh, and you get open that up with command shift or control plus shift plus I is only going to be showing the uh, key editor. You see Sergo just saying he loves Yamaha Corporation products. They do a lot of great stuff. Proud to be an employee. All right, we have Nico from Belgium. And Sergo wants to buy a Yamaha THR amplifier. So Peter just saying, I sound a little congested today, so I am getting over a cold I had over the weekend, so I'm feeling much better. But you may still hear my voice, and I may kind of mute my microphone for a cough a bit more frequently than usual. All right. Happy to have Graham stop by real quick. Sorry to hear that you had your mom's funeral today. So you'll be in our thoughts. All right, we have Rob checking in from Montreal and Jeff Sabelski from Chico, California. Okay, so I see a question. Um, in the project logical editor, you can use date in parameter one when action target is set to name. Where is there a list of all possible editor variables that could be used like this? Um, so I think if we wanted to, let's, let's say if I wanted to come here to the project logical editor, And I wanted to just set name, or let's we'll first just kind of set our action target here. So let's say uh, container type equals track, and then we could say under name. Um, so we could append, and then 
once you kind of come over here, you could say, you know, once you see these different uh, naming conventions, let's so say if we come over here to name, you know, we could choose to, uh, you know, replace. And then if you're looking for all the different uh, functions, you know, we could append to different things. So let's say if I wanted to do the date, so okay, so this is the date. So at this point, we could come over here. So a lot of times, um, so I don't see a particular list. It may be specified in the manual uh, as to different parameters that are available in the naming conventions. I believe all the different options uh, do show up there as opposed to, uh, but you can see where that could be problematic if you didn't know to type in date uh, there. But, um, but I believe it's gonna be specified in the manual for available parameters under the naming conventions, but I could check afterwards if you want to send me an email. And just so you couldn't find anything uh, with the date variable in the documentation. So I'll, I'll do another search and see if there's any other like little hidden things as well. Okay, reading through and just saying kind of a further comment on the 808 samples and the difference in sound. If you have a particular sample that you want to share with me that you're able to share, I'd be happy to kind of take a look at it. Uh, you could email it to me at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so we see from David Griffith's uh, question. I recently bought a trackball mouse, which can have uniquely assignable buttons. How can I assign those to specific actions in Cubase, thinking about zoom and play stop, etc.? So usually most of those would have, uh, most uh, mice that you have like that would have a little, uh, like a little applet or a little app that would say, okay, when I hit this button, it triggers this particular keyboard shortcut. So generally those are gonna be set in the particular app. Uh, if you want it to come over here, it may also just kind of transmit like a, key, uh, like a keyboard shortcut. You could try to select the particular function here. So let's say, okay, I want it to zoom uh, so I wanted to undo zoom, try coming over here and you can say type in key and then you may be able to just hit the button on your mouse once you have this field active and see if that transmits a key. But most of the time it's just kind of like transmitting a key on your computer keyboard. So you could assign it in the control panel software to do the particular function or you could uh, try to just assign it directly inside of Cubase as well. All right, so we have Peter from Montreal. All right, so we have a question for me. Uh, are you going to miss the dongle? Um, so I, I don't mind the dongle. I like having everything always, you know, as someone who's had to swap out their computers, I don't mind... Uh, the convenience of the dongle, but I think the new system will be good for a lot of people. So, uh, so uh, you, you may want to ask me in a year, but um, you know, I I just even since the Atari days, I plugged my dongle in, and I don't think about it too much. And I would always be the one who you know would travel. You know, pre COVID, I was doing 120 flights a year. I never lost a dongle in all my travels and stuff like that. Um, so it never really bothered me. So, but I think the new system will be good and help out a lot of people.
All right, so we have a question from Rob. Uh, do you know if we'll be able to use older versions without the dongle once 12 releases? So the older versions are gonna be tied, uh, you know, pretty intensely to the e-licensor software. So it will be all the previous versions to 12. So 11 and before will all still require the USB e-licensor. And to use a new license management system, you're gonna to have to be using Cubase 12 or higher. All right, we have Matthew Elston checking in from London. Thanks for joining the live stream. And we see Michael Pierce is also on. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, what do we do with our dongle when 12 comes out? Will they be useless? No, you know, they still will have, you know, your all of your old Cubase licenses. So if you wanted to run uh, you know, older computers, and it's not uncommon, like I had to, uh, you know, get together some Atari dongles for Junky XL. So, you know, um, so he could do a particular project. So, you know, your Cubase 11 license, uh, you know, will still be functional on your, your USB e license, or you could run that on, I think you should be able to run it on a separate computer than your Cubase 12 if you want it to. So, um, so I would keep it and utilize it for loading up projects on, you know, previous generations of computers or, uh, you know, previous uh, versions of Cubase when needed. We see Peter's just uh, mentioning that he's done some button assignment on his Kensington trackball. Uh, so we see is Cubase taught at universities? So yeah, th yes, there's a lot of colleges that teach Cubase. Uh, I know like Berkeley College of Music and their whole film scoring is done on Cubase, but we have a number of colleges in the US and throughout the world that teach Cubase. But a lot of people, you know, will choose to learn it kind of independently on uh, using, you know, wonderful resources that people can find on YouTube. But yeah, there's a lot of colleges that you could go as well. All right, uh, so we see, hi Greg, how can I set the grid and click time back to the defaults it was at the initial Cubase installation? So it sounds like maybe uh, when we're here, let's say if I, Turn on my click track. Uh, so if you have the click track active here, um, you may notice that if we just go to the right of it, we can see our, our click pattern. And then you may have like half tempo or double tempo. Or if you want to do six, eight, So, but if you just come here to the default, uh, you'll have just a setting for default. If you don't, if you can't get that going on the uh, main transport bar, you could just add a signature track and then double click here. And then you'll see from the info line where you could just change it to the default, uh, default time. So let me know if that is helpful. Great, reading through comments. All right, so we see that Michael Teams is on the live stream. So, and he wants people to whack the like button. All right, and we have Theodore checking in from London.
All right, and Pablo has made an appearance. So we have three quarters of hot mess here. Okay, so we see, is it possible to apply separate direct processing to different clips within an audio part um, and to the audio part as a whole as well? I get crashes when I try to do this. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to take uh, the bass part here, so let's say we listen to it just. Okay, so I will process just the uh, the entire file. So I'll come over here to direct offline processing or hit F7. So I will do, um, let's say something obvious. Let's make it a flanger. So now as we play, okay. And let's say right here, I just want I'll just grab my selection tool and I want to do just a delay. On that section, so we'll have our flanging. And let's say I want to take this part of the base and reverse it. So we hear delay, now we should hear the reverse. So, and let's do one more process here. Let's um, do a fade out. So all those processing on individual clips or globally or on selected sections doesn't seem to have any problem. Uh, so if I wanted to undo all that, we could just delete all and we're right back to where we were. So let me know if that you're doing it the same way. Everyone's always happy when Pablo is back. All right, so we have Tiago checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining. My timeline jumped on me, let me just, okay, so I think I'm back, all right. All right, so we have a question um, <clears throat> from Jay from Connecticut. Uh, I'm trying to figure out for my nephew and a couple others uh, without mic setups, whether Cubasis allows audio into phone. Uh, also, will Cubasis interoperate with Cubase desktop? Okay, um, so you could just record directly into your iPhone or Android phone using Cubasis, uh, using the microphones, uh, you know, the phone microphone, if you want it to. So there's no problem with that. Or if you have an audio interface that will work with it, that's iOS or Android compatible, that will work. Um, and so in the second question, will Cubase interoperate with Cubase uh, desktop? So Cubasis, they, they don't necessarily operate together, but you can take your Cubasis project and come over here to and import it into Cubase. But the two don't work together in sync. They'll kind of run uh, as separate programs. And then you could take your Cubasis project and import it into Cubase to do more work on it if needed. All right, so Nick has gotten pumpkin spice ice cream, so very seasonal choice. Nice, nice selection, Michael Teens. All 
All right, and we have Jola Media Productions checking in from DeSoto, Texas. Thanks for joining. So we see uh, just Michael Pierce just saying one of our artists spent last night in York in the UK with Bose and Yamaha playing expensive acoustic guitars. He was hoping he get gain sponsorship. So yeah, good luck. So maybe if he played through Yamaha uh, stuff, if he's looking for a Yamaha sponsorship, that might have helped. But but we hope he gets signed on. You see Jazz Dude saying he has Yamaha NS1000 monitors in his high-end audio collection. Uh, great times for the for Yamaha's end of the 70s. Yeah, last time we saw NS1000 was in uh, Alan Holdsworth's studio. All right, so we have Felipe from Portugal. Thanks for joining. And we see Kai Wen Franklin is on. Okay, so I just see uh, anytime I record, my tempo is always off. Um, so I'm not sure if you know you're recording to the click track. So sometimes people will uh, record, you know, and maybe the tempo is set to default uh, when you do a new project. Of so I'll just come here. Let's do an empty project. We'll create. So sometimes people will turn the click track off and record an audio file. And let's say they record at 96 beats a minute or whatever tempo that they're recording at. Uh, and then they turn on a click track and at that point realize that the tempo that they recorded to might not match the the recording of the click track. So if, so if you could let us know if you recorded with the click track um, enabled to set the tempo or if you turned on the click track afterwards. So that would lead to kind of a, you know, the two of them being not related to each other. If that's the case, what you could do is select the track and then go into your project and do a tempo detection and then Cubase could do a detection of your tempo, but if you give us a little more information, that would be helpful. All right, so we have Marcos checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining. All right, so we have a question, uh, Greg. What about the programs like Groove Agent and Halion Six? Will they use a new security in Cubase Twelve? So, if you have, uh, you know, generally the catalog will, you know, as the next versions are released, uh, or there will be updates, kind of getting the whole new system into uh, the new license management system. So once. I think the first program is going to be Dorco. The second program will be Cubase. So it, it might be that you may be running Cubase 12 without a USB e-licensor, but the USB e-licensor may still be needed for some plugins like you know the, the full version of Groove Agent, uh, the full version of Halion. Uh, but like the instruments that come with Cubase will be able to run without the USB e licensor and the other ones will eventually get updated. So it'll be kind of gradually rolling out so that all of the Steinberg products uh, will be utilizing the new license management system.
All right, so we see, uh, is there any way to enlarge the text in Cubase? I have poor eyes. Uh, if not, is there a program? Uh, I love Cubase, but find myself using other DAWs that have this ability. So it could really depend on what, you know, the text could be dependent upon the screen resolution that you're running. So sometimes people, you know, looks really small until you go to like a high DPI, you know, it may look really small. And then if you're on Windows, try to go to your preferences. And under general, you could enable high DPI and then you could have like the application scaling set. So try to do that if you're on a Windows platform, but it's using kind of whatever, uh, you know, the text size is going to be dependent upon the screen resolution that you're running. All right, so we see Dave McKay. He's just talking about uh, Belmont and Nashville running Cubase. So great to see you on the live stream, Dave. Hope you're doing well. And it's a wonderful program in Nashville. All right, so we just see, hi, Greg, what does the second panner do? Uh, do I use it? So I'm not sure if it's, um, sometimes we'll get a, let me just add some audio tracks here. Okay, so when we go to add audio tracks, we could have uh, just on, if it's with this panner, we could have it serve as a balance where I could take a stereo track or a mono track and just, you know, apply, you know, move it over to the left or right, kind of a traditional balance. But if it's on a stereo track, we could also have a stereo combined panner. And this would allow us to set different amounts of the panning to the left or right. So if I want it more spread to the right or more spread to the left, or if I wanted to invert the panning settings, we could just kind of keep going up or down and invert the panning like that. I also sometimes get this question on some of the projects when I go to my audio connections and I add a output bus, let's say it's a 5.1, then the panner can grow to accommodate kind of uh, like my 5.1 panning. But if I just have a stereo track, it's still gonna only allow us to pan to the left and right channels. So let me know if that is makes sense. And once that bus is removed, I get my traditional panners back. All right, uh, so we just see uh, from Kai Wen Franklin, um, does Howling at 6 have any instruments that use expression maps or key switches? I have been uh, learning about expression maps, uh, at least trying to learn. So yeah, a lot of the instruments will do it. So many of the instruments that you purchase will do that, but um, one easy way to kind of look at some of the sounds that will utilize key switches is you may see an extension for VX the letters VX, so I'll just come here to all. And let's say if I just wanted to come over here in my name field search, I'll just do VX. So let's say I want a nylon guitar, VX. So now we can see that this one will have key switches or if I want to do large strings, VX. Now, if you want to automatically, once it's in Halion, and one of the great things with Halion is if I have a part that's created here, we could go directly into uh, our expression map. And if it's created in Halion, we could just say import the key switches. So at this point we could say, okay, now I'm playing. We could have normal or you could choose to 
we'll look at our articulations and dynamics here so we can now switch to different articulations just make this a little larger so it's easier to see so now if i wanted this to be legato strings so let's say if i want this to be legato i could just we'll just kind of have it send its key switch and now and let's say I want it to be spiccato, starting right here. And let's say I want to do tremolo, starting right here. So as I play a note. And let's say, okay, I want to go to hard. And too soft. And let's say to ensemble here. So the import key switches for Halion instruments is a great feature. So <clears throat> so give that a try, but look for instruments that uh, you you know, just to kind of search just based on uh, suffix of VX and you'll see a number of onboard. And then if once you get into like the orchestral instruments like Iconica or Halion Symphonic Orchestra, those will be lots of key switches and uh, that are automatically included. So many of the libraries will also take advantage of that. All right, wonderful to see Cedric on the live stream. lost my spot let me just find it again okay so we have a question can you tell us what is the best way to use supervision in order to finalize uh, slash master a project okay I'll play a little bit of cloud castles here All right, so um, a lot of times, you know, what you could use supervision for is just kind of look for, you know, like phasing issues is kind of a, a really good use of it. So let's say if I'm just kind of playing back a particular track. Let's say if I take the bass part here and I flip the phase. So often if you would see So with a lot of phase stuff, if you see this kind of be wider at this point that's a good indication of phase relationships and as you look at this we could actually see different phase problems and frequencies that could cause phase problems So this is like a really good example where there's we don't have lots of frequencies that are causing phase. So, you know, I mean, we have a lot of people who use it for doing, you know, levels. So levels are really important as well. So make sure that we have kind of an even frequency distribution. 
that we're not too hot level wise. We can see our loudness, kind of our intensity of frequencies and phase. And then if you're really good, you could actually um, just kind of take one of these and you could turn it into and play Pong if you want. So that's really good if you get paid by the hour in the studio. Um, so there's a special trick for that, but you could actually have it play Pong and enable game mode with a special secret. Uh, but mostly for, I would uh, just use it for primarily phase and levels. Uh, just to determine like what particular frequencies are causing phase problems and then you could kind of fix that within your mix very easily. All right, so just see, uh, Greg, I switched to a new PC, Cubase 11 Pro, Windows 11 Pro. Uh, I found out with a new Microsoft mouse, it's impossible to press the left and right mouse button at the same time, so I can't use the pointer selection. Uh, any ideas? <clears throat> I haven't come across that, especially with any of the Microsoft mice. Um, so I'm... So, but I haven't, you know, and I usually, I have one on my studio computer, a Microsoft mouse, um, and I haven't had that problem, but when you say the pointer selector, so I'm not sure if it's just, uh, but let me know what you want, how you're using the pointer selector as well and just maybe i might be able to help out a little bit more all right so we're seeing christmas themed ice cream so agent k has gotten three scoops of eggnog ice cream you see that john costigan's neighbor's wife hunts turkeys all right, and we have Yash checking in from Sussex in the UK. Okay, so we just see, uh, what's the most efficient way to take a song with several tracks and while keeping the same tempo, apply it a click track? Okay, just... Um, okay, so I'm not sure if, like, if it's a recording that's already been done without a click track, so let me just open... Okay, so let's say if I have um, a multi-track audio recording here, and I turn on my click, and the click isn't aligned with the tracks, I could just, I'm gonna like select one of the tracks, maybe like an overhead drum track. 
and just go to tempo detection. Hit analyze. And then Cubase can automatically kind of do a tempo detection of the audio file itself. So as we kind of play, So the audio is the same tempo, but now we've extracted a tempo map from the audio performance. Uh, so let me know if that's what you want to do to make a click track from that. Okay, so we have a question from Marcos. Uh, if I use Cubase with, <laughs> excuse me, with analog gear, uh, would be great. Only printing or offline is the same uh, about quality. So you know, if you're, um, so you know, you you would have the same quality. You know, if you're, you know, if you're utilizing it as an external effect processor um so let's say if we come over here to uh your audio connections and we have it defined as an external effects where we're going in and out so you know that would allow you to utilize the outboard gear without any problems and you could delay compensate for it uh so i'm not sure you know so there's no problem there. And if it, you know, it might sound slightly different if you're doing it as an internal loop uh, versus just kind of playing through the outboard gear and a way out just because the signal isn't being converted again. So depending on your converters, I think you have the UR22. Those are wonderful converters as you kind of have discovered that you might benefit from bringing it back in and converting it for after going to the out, out, you know, the, to the external processing. So, so I think you will probably benefit using it as kind of an external process inside of Cubase. All right, so we just see um, in our question on the new license management systems. Uh, I hear quite a bit of discussion regarding Cubase leaving eLicenser. However, I hear none about Nuendo and Absolute, uh, VST, et cetera. Am I overlooking? So it, it has been announced that Nuendo would happen after Cubase, probably with the next generation of Nuendo. And uh, then I think we'll start seeing virtual instruments uh, migrating over to the new licensing system. So the intention is all the products will eventually be on new license management system. And they'll be kind of staggering in and the first program to do it will be Dorco 4. Michael Pierce is his is, uh, client was already using Bo's stuff and Yamaha has been sending him guitars so that's great I know that the uh, they have a guitar group in the UK that does a really wonderful job We're seeing Michael Pierce just saying um, that the Yamaha acoustic guitar is recorded really well too. So yeah, I've always had wonderful experience. Like even the you know hundred ninety nine dollar Yamaha guitars are kind of way better than their uh, their price point would would lead you to think. So and they're able to offer such great guitars because they make more acoustic guitars than any other company in the world. 
Okay, um, so we have a question. Uh, I added an extra pre-count bar uh, to start at bar zero. How can I change it back to start at bar one as it was when Cubase was first installed? All right, so let's say if I'm looking at my project here, we're starting at measure one. Uh, so if you go to Shift S, we get to come over here and this would open up the project setup, which you could also access from the project setup menu. Uh, from project setup in project setup. So right now it's probably set to display bar offset of minus one. So if we do this, we'll have, I'm sorry, let me just set this to one. And as we do this, we'll see a measure zero. So you have a, a little bit of pre-roll. So just go to the project setup and set the display bar offset to zero. And then your project will start at measure one. Um, so we just see, do Steinberg plugins use oversampling? I think some of the plugins do, uh, but there is also kind of what can be more important is that the resolution of the processing can also be changed. So if you wanted to come to your studio setup, um, you could actually do the processing precision for all the internal plugins could be done at 64 bit floating point. So at that point, you could have double the precision. So that's another way to, uh, you know, have more precise precision. But I think some of the plugins will do it with sampling rate. But I think you probably get more benefit from uh, and more resolution from the processing precision set to 64-bit floating point. All right, so um, all right, so we have Carmen checking in from Australia, giving us a good day from Australia. So, my, one of my favorite countries I've ever been to. Thanks for joining us. I know it's really early or really late there. All right, uh, so we have a question from Denny. Uh, is it possible to to click turns on automatically when I press record and have record highlighted? All right, so let's come over here to the transport and go to the metronome setup. Um, and I think we could have uh, click during, click while recording. So now that I'm playing, I don't hear the click. And as I hit record, that the click turns on and we could have the click turned on in the pre-roll. So again, go to transport to metronome setup and you can have in the click options under the general tab you could just have click while recording enabled and not while playing so i think that will get you what you want to accomplish but it's not when record is highlighted See, Nick is giving everyone a virtual pot of coffee. That's that's not fair. So now I want a coffee, and I have another hour or two hours and 50 minutes to go. But thank you for the gesture for everyone else. All right, so we just see, uh, please, can I get a vocal effect template for mixing in Cubase 11. So often templates are more for entire projects, but if you wanted to do, you know, vocals, you know, come over here and if we'll go to media and let's go to, uh, we'll see presets and you'll see track presets for audio. And then you could just say, 
uh, lead vocal, and then you have a number of different presets here, and you could just drag these over. So let's say, okay, I want this, I could just drag this over to the particular channel. So let's say, okay, I'm on my snare track. I want to try this. So try using not necessarily a template, but track presets. And then you can modify and save and drag over your own vocal presets as well without having a template, which may be for the entire project. So try to utilize the built-in track presets for vocals. All right, so we just see, um, so question, there are two panners in the automation lanes. What does left, right, two do? So sometimes that could be associated with surround, but let's go ahead and just give it a shot. Okay, so I'll just start a new stereo track. I'll add the stereo audio track. Okay, so we'll look at our automation here. Just turn off my grid here. All right, so linked panner, I think, will allow us to we'll So let me just open up the automation parameter to reveal parameter on right. I'll automate this. Okay, so that's our standard panner. So we see the panning automation here. 
So I believe that this is going to be maybe if you're doing left and right surround, that this would be your surround as left to right two. That would be the surround panners. All right, so we have a question. Uh, <clears throat> when will we be able to move our tracks in the mixer freely without moving the tracks in the arrangement window? It's about time. So I know it's a long standing feature request. Uh, I know that the product planning and development teams are aware of it. Uh, so we'll have to see if it gets implemented soon, but I know that it's, uh, you know, a, everyone is aware of it but it may not have the highest priority over other features that people want but i'll make sure to reiterate it again I'm just trying to find my place my time field jumped Uh, all right, so we have a question. Uh, why does Cubase load settings from the last open project? Uh, example, loop points, metronome, open windows into the next project. Is there a way to load a project with all settings as saved? I believe that some of the settings that you may activate, you know, there are some settings like, you know, when you do the control room, that's, that's kind of saved globally. You know, that's kind of saved at the Cubase level and not necessarily associated with a particular project. So some settings and parameters that you may adjust are going to be almost not project based, but like globally based within your Cubase environment. Because every time if you have, once you have your control room set up, you probably want that to be the same without having to reconfigure that every time you load a new project. So I think that those parameters are ones that are uh you know global based instead of project based and that's why they will stick all right wonderful to see sable on the live stream hope you're doing well All right, so question, uh, is there a backup folder in Cubase? So generally, you know, if we have your projects that are backed up and we get to have this by default every 10 minutes, it's gonna get backed up at the same level, uh, at the same kind of directory level as the project itself. So it doesn't go into a backup folder, but goes directly to the same level so that you know exactly uh, where the, you know, so the same area that the project is at that point, you'll see like a dot BAK file and those are the backup files. So it's not in an independent folder. It's at the same folder at the project level. Okay, we have a question, Greg. I notice your project screen gets uh, grid reads like qu use quantize. My screen shows 1000 milliseconds. How do I change mine like yours? So it depends on what your master time is set to. So if I switch my master time here to be seconds, I see this represented in 1000 milliseconds, one milliseconds. If I switch to bars and beats, I could use quantize bar beat or adapt to zoom. If I go to sample, or let's say time code, I could have it based on frames. So just right click in the master timeline to bars and beats, and then you can 
set your grid based upon the currently active disp time display format. All right, so we have Alexander from Moscow checking in. Thanks for joining. Seeing nice comments on Cloud Castles. Michael Team singing and wrote that. All right, so we just have someone saying, I need to say Cubase is amazing, was eight years in Logic and three years in Ableton. So that's great. Welcome to the Steinberg family. All right, so we have a question from Chris Hallam. Uh, do expression maps need to be recalled for each project? Or is there a way to view your saved expression maps within Cubase by putting them all in the same folder? So the, you know, if you have created your own expression maps, like if you're using an instrument that's not like Hallian, the expression maps can be stored anywhere. Some people may choose to have like one common folder uh, other people may store it. I think you could save it within a track preset. So you say, okay, let's go to, you know, this string library. And then the track preset has the expression map automatically configured so that when you load the track preset, the expression map will be there. And many times people will save it within a template so that every time you start, you know, many composers will start with a particular template and any time that they you know go to that particular track all the expression maps will automatically be there so that's what most people will do all right so we have a question uh is there a recommendation for headroom i should leave before the master uh doing modern pop tracks um so it could really depend on if you're the final person or you plan on sending it out to mastering. So I know a lot of people, uh, some of my friends in Nashville, they're really highly regarded mix engineers will aim for minus six and then back everything down to give themselves about minus 12 dB often before sending it out to mastering. If what you're doing is like your own project and you're kind of delivering it and not sending it to mastering, you know, aim for around minus six, you know, maybe for like a pop dance thing where it needs to be really hot, you know, maybe just a little bit hotter, but, you know, realize that sometimes when you get it too hot, the different platforms will apply compression and can, you know, bring it down. So, you know, many times you could also use loudness units. So if we go to the meter here and we look at the loudness, you could, you know, if it's going to be something that's going to be played on Spotify, you know, I think they aim for minus 14 luffs. If it's you like for broadcast in the United States, they aim for minus 23 luffs. So, you know, give yourself more headroom if you're, you know, sending it off to someone else to be mastered. But if you're doing it yourself, you know, you don't need as much. Okay, so I just see from Sergo from the Cubase Club, can you make the Cubase family? So I'm not sure if I understand, but uh, let me know if there's a question in there. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, how can I quickly disable all sends and inserts in a project? Okay, try this.
Okay, so let's say I'm looking at in my main mix console window here. Um, all right, so let's say we have a number of sends and inserts. Okay, so if I wanted to disable all of my inserts, we'll see here at the top where you see inserts, uh, EQ, sends, uh, and channel strips. So I could come right over here and you wanna hold down the Alt or Option key. And then that will bypass all of the inserts and that will bypass all of the sends directly from the main uh, standalone mixer. So right at the top, hold down Alt or Option and then you could bypass all the inserts and sends just there like that, very easy. All right, reading through comments and getting lots of phone calls today. <clears throat> All right, so we see, hey Greg, is there a way to have the main project quantize grid also show in a free warp window? I uh, can't figure out how to change the grid size in the free warp window. All right, so let's say if we're here and we're doing free warping, so it doesn't carry over. And I think that the grid in the free in the sample editor that like doesn't allow you to do triplets. Um, so let's say if we're here, we're in the sample editor, and we wanted to do, you know, free warping of the event, we could kind of see it in sixteenth notes, but. That's kind of how the grid is done within the sample editor. Hopefully we'll see some changes of that coming where you know the grids can be interchanged, but they're kind of different where this we could set to triplets, but we can't do the warping here only in the sample editor. And here we can only be limited to 16th notes for the grid. So sorry about that. All right, so we see from Murray, any news of what's new slash better in 12? So the only two things that have been announced will be uh, Mac M1 native processing and the new license management system. So generally, um, Steinberg doesn't, you know, necessarily, you know, reveal features months in advance. So I'm surprised that we even learned that. Um, but, you know, so generally as a rule of thumb, and it's not that they're trying to be difficult things could change at the last minute uh, and some features may get pushed back. So, you know, when it's out is when all the features will be revealed, but those are the two things that have been revealed on the Steinberg forums. Okay, so we have a question. 
Excuse me, I just clear my throat. All right, uh, it says when I have MIDI, many MIDI tracks, I often have them quantized to different settings. Uh, do you have any tips on keeping an eye out on what has been quantized to which setting? So I think once we're in a larger MIDI project, so let me just get a one here as, find one I'm thinking of. do this so I think once we actually come over here I just uh, I just see something that says where is the sound gone I'm gonna do a quick monitor test bear with me for a second make sure everything is coming through so i think once we okay. actually come over here it's just uh... all right it sounds like the sound is still going on sorry for that just want to make sure it's a bummer to do a whole live stream if you don't hear me talk or hear the audio so I believe that once, you know, we quantize an event, it's just going to indicate that it's quantized, but not necessarily to what the quantization value was. So it's only going to indicate that, you know, a particular event was quantized or not. And we can see that in the undo history. So if I have this set to eighths and I quantize... And we go to our edit undo history. Yeah, so it doesn't, I'll look one more place. Yeah, so it's not going to indicate what the quantized value was, just that it was quantized. Sorry about that. But you could always go back to the original quant, you know, whenever you apply a quantization to the part, it would always do it from the original part. So it wasn't like if you quantized it to whole notes and then you wanted to quantize it to eighth notes, it doesn't quantize the whole notes to eighth notes, but goes back to the original data and quantizes that to eighth notes. Right, so we see from Sergo, there are children here. Are they interestingly able to master Cubase? So, you know, uh, we have lots of kids that run Cubase uh, very well. So, uh, and we have lots of blind people and, you know, that also run Cubase. And, you know, probably Stevie Wonder is one of the fastest Cubase users I've ever seen. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, on MIDI editor, how to change the velocity of a specific note without changing others when you have many notes played at the same time, many notes in one place? Okay, so let's look at this and let's say we have a chord that's going on and we wanted to just change the velocity of just this particular note. So I think it's just uh, control or command plus shift. And then you could just, as you hover over a particular note within a chord, you could adjust only, you know, when we go to adjust the velocity here, we don't know which, they're all playing at the same time, we don't know which 
So just hold control or command plus shift. And then you could just kind of hover over different velocity values here. So that's really all you have to do, control or command shift, and then you could adjust the velocities within the chord individually. All right, if you learn a new trick, make sure that you do hit the, uh, do hit the like button. All right, we see Randy Lee's joined the live stream. Thanks for being a part of the community again. All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you make pre-roll longer than two measures? All right. Um, so let's come over here to our pre-roll settings. Okay, so now when we come over here, we could set our pre-roll amount. So let's say I'm at measure 97 and I wanted three measures of pre-roll. So I'm just gonna come activate pre-roll. And let's say I wanted three measures of pre-roll. So now when I hit play, it goes back so let's say I started at 95, and now if it's three measures, I'll just say 3.00. So let's say we're at 98, so it should pre-roll from measure 95. But you may have to, once you activate pre-roll, directly from here, you might have to just, where you see kind of the pre-roll settings, you may have to just kind of make sure that that is visible here. So that could be hidden. So you may have to just, where you see the three vertical dots, you may have to kind of extend that over to see the pre-roll amount, and then you could set that to various levels right there. All right, so we have a question. Uh, will Steinberg ever bring back Wonderverb, which is a beautiful reverb from Cubase 3? So. I haven't heard of any plans for that. Uh, I haven't thought of Wonderverb in a long time, so I guess that came out uh, in VST. Uh, I think it came out in VST 3.7. Um, interestingly enough, I believe that the Wonderverb was actually developed by one of the guys who uh, co-founded Propeller Head. So I, I wouldn't anticipate it. Uh, you know, being reintroduced, it was a very simple reverb, but it did sound really good. Uh, so, but I'm not sure if that code is still around or, uh, but I, I wouldn't anticipate it, but I'll mention it. All right. So we have a question. Um, how do I get automation to move with the track if I move the track? Okay. All right, so let's say if I have automation here. Um, so if I move the track, you still see the automation carried on, you know, with that particular track. Now, if I move the event in time, what you need to do is just go, I think it's in the edit menu just check automation follows events so now as we move an event the automation will automatically be moved with it you don't have to worry about it so once again just make sure that you have and i believe this is on by default but if not go to edit a menu to automation follows events and then any automation you have will just automatically follow the event as it's moved in the timeline so if we move it in time or move the track it'll be moved right along with it so you don't need that as you move the track up or down but let me know if that helps
All right, so we see, uh, can I use uh, two lanes in a MIDI track to edit a left and right hand piano score, assign a lane for the treble clef staff and another lane for the bass clef staff? Um, let's go ahead and take a look. Thanks for all the great questions. Right, and let me just All right, so I'll just do a quick MIDI recording here. Let me just set my click track settings here. here and I'll do All right and if I hit record this time it would help So I have both of these events here. Let's look at them in my score editor. So I just selected both of the events. And as we do this, I go to my score editor and I want to come over here and double click to open up the score settings and let's set it to a split point at C3. And at that point, you could just have it automatically just kind of mapped directly out for you. So let's say if I wanted to transpose all of these notes here. So that way you could have it on the grand staff, just like that. So, and I'll show you the record mode. So I just put it into stacked here and selected both events uh, and under I just did a quick cycled record, even though I didn't loop it. Uh, and then both those events will kind of automatically show up in the score editor. Okay, reading more questions and comments.
Okay, so we see, uh, am I able to use the Nectar Impact MIDI keyboards mod wheel to control the expression of stock VSTs like Hallian's strings? Um, so it depends on the instrument and how it's set up. So let's say if I wanted to add, um, so let's say if I'm in Hallian 6, you know, let's say I already have it loaded up here. I will open up the instrument. So for instance, if we go to the Hallian Symphonic Orchestra, and then we go to the macro, you could actually see kind of the expression controllers. It's really depending on whatever the instrument is set up to. So a lot of orchestral instruments, you could configure what controller, like your modulation wheel is controlling it. So. That's often how it works is just and many times it's user definable. So you could have kind of a common set of controls across different libraries. Uh, so we have a question. Is there ever a reason to produce electronic music at 96 K? So most people tend not to use 96 K, uh, for EDM music. Uh, you know, it can be done. It's not going to hurt anything. Some people may have certain plugins they, they think may sound better at 96 K. Some people, you know, many of my kind of, you know, famous EDM producer friends that are Cubase, you know, tend to do everything at 44.1. So you're not going to hurt anything doing it 96 K. Uh, but you know, so you could try the same project and just kind of switch and see if there's any sonic difference to you. And it may, you know, depending on the instrumentation and what synthesizers and, you know, the mix, how it's going to work. All right, so we have a question uh, from Kai. Uh, it says, uh, in order to use expression maps, doesn't the VST instrument have to have some built-in expression to use? I'm confused. Am I missing something? So often the expression maps are going to be uh, switching between different articulations. So if I wanted to come over here to uh, you know, a string patch, so let's say if I'm looking at... Um, trumpet combi so now when i would play this particular trumpet patch there would be different articulations to kind of just play the trumpet and if i hit this key you would probably just get you know different articulation so if the instrument is not set up to do key switches, then the expression maps, you know, won't make much sense and you won't get much benefit of that. But, you know, many instruments will, you know, you hit this key switch or send this MIDI message, it will switch the sound. And it's often in trying to work with, you know, different orchestral or like violin sounds. So if you wanted to uh, come over here to, let's do like a cello. So I will come here. And then if we hit a key switch that we could come over here and just say, okay, now we're doing, we could just say, okay, let's do tremolo. Uh, so this would allow you to switch the sound as you play the keys. So if that doesn't exist in a particular uh, preset, then, uh, you know, the expression maps won't make much sense, but it's to kind of unleash all these different sounds that are available with one instrument that it's often elusive and that people don't do when the developers have come up with all these different samples for this particular area so that you could have more expression on a particular instrument. So this allows you to kind of utilize the different sounds that your instrument has easier.
Um, all right, so I just see, hi, when I import an audio file into Cubase, it imports, but starts directly at the audio, the empty portion is left out. So let's go ahead and see if I could recreate that. I don't think that there's anything that Cubase is doing for that. But let's say if I move this particular audio file here. All right, so we'll have just measures of silence of, and then measure then silence before and after the event. So let's say I'll export this audio file. So I'll do an export audio mix down. All right, and I'm going to save it. Okay, and now I'm gonna import that particular audio file. Oh, I had that record enabled, sorry about that. All right, so I'll just call this A silence. Okay, so let me just change my color here of this event. That's what the problem is. So as you can see, there's the beginning and audio and the beginning silence and the end. So I don't think Cubase does anything to automatically kind of clip, you know, truncate the audio file if there is silence. Uh, so check maybe the file if it's, you know, where it's exported from or play it in a different file. But, you know, I don't know of any setting where Cubase would automatically just say there's an, it's silence there. If it's part of the audio file, whether it's silence or not, Cubase will import it. So I'm just going to adjust my color setup here. Sorry about that. All right. So yeah. Um, so check to make sure that the file you're importing, maybe it was truncated when it was exported from a different program.
All right. Uh, so I just see another question. Uh, what button can I press in Cubase to make the SSL UF8 show the current selected track? Um, So I don't have an SSL UF8. I know sometimes with Mackie control, you know, depending on what track that you have selected, uh, sometimes Mackie control protocols may not kind of go both ways with that. Um, but I don't have a UF8, so I'm not that familiar with it, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, But there should be maybe, um, so if you wanted to show the currently selected track, see if there's something like an edit channel settings. You know, I think most controllers will have that. So if you wanted to see this particular track, there should be something like an edit channel settings or come over to your studio setup under your Mackie control. And then you could probably just come over here to edit edit channel settings and then once you do that that should uh, when you hit that user assigned button you should be able to see the the can uh, that the selected channel uh, if you wanted to see you know so just come over here to your Mackie control, make sure that you have this defined and under edit, edit channel settings. But sorry, I don't have UF8 to test. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I bought a new UR44C. Now when I try to pre-listen to samples in the media tab and loops and samples, I do not get any sounds through my speaker. What has happened to the audio routing? Is it wrong? So probably come over here to the uh, studio, to audio connections, and go to the control room. And this may seem counterintuitive at first, but set your outputs to not connected. Go to the control room and set this, uh, like add a monitor and then set up, like I have my UR24C here in the control room. And now as you go to audition different samples, you can hear it directly. And that gets routed through the control room. So try activating that. Make sure you're going into the control room. All right, so we see, is there going to be a Black Friday sale this year? Um, so it may not be called Black Friday sale. Evidently, someone in Germany has Black Friday as a trademark, but there, there may be a promotion coming up very soon. Maybe check uh, 24 hours from now or so. So, uh, But I think there'll be a lot of good things for people to check out. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, I have a plugin on track one and a plugin is visible. Uh, then I put the same plugin on track two. When I go from track one to track two, the plugin of track one does not change in two. Um, okay, so I was just go ahead and add tracks here. Okay, so let's just so we have a mod machine. Delay. OK, 
Okay. All right. So if we, so it says, um, so it says I have a plugin on track one and the plugin is visible. All right. So we have this visible. Uh, then I put the same plugin on track two. Uh, when I go from track one to track two, the plugin of track one does not change in two. You know, because what you told the program to do is to actually look at this particular plugin. So now if I'm looking at this, I need to tell the program to look at this particular plugin. So, you know, you're not saying look at the look at insert one. You didn't open insert one. You opened up insert one on this particular channel. So sometimes, you know, it may be annoying if you're um, you know, tweaking the parameters of one plugin, you have another track selected, and maybe you're adjusting the EQ that the plugin that you were adjusting and tweaking automatically changed based on the selected channel. So the concept is whatever you tell it to look at, that is the plugin that's visible. So it's not going to automatically open up that particular plugin. So if you have it in like the channel strip, so let's say if I'm here in the channel strip, and we have this open and let's say we have EQ and then I wanted to just go to the next channel at this point, like the channel strip, since this is going to be common between the two programs. And this is kind of part of, <coughs> excuse me, of the program, I could go up and down here and see this but if you just come over here and want to see you know the plugin change as we come over here it's going to be based on what is selected so um so not by the active channel selecting but what plugin and what track um and if you do that for 16 inserts on different tracks that's when you get into all sorts of problems so we see Randy Lee just asking who gave a thumbs down. So we can't make everyone happy, but we, we try to give some free knowledge. All right, so we see, hello, how, how do I change my right click toolbox in Cubase 11 in earlier versions? I can hold it and resize it. So, you know, some of the functions are different since version 10. When it went to high DPI, so if you wanted to just come over here, we could uh, get the additional functions here. You could also hold down the control key and click and get you know different context sensitive functions. But it doesn't. It's kind of a fixed size since version ten. There we see Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Okay, so we see a uh, from, question from Kai Wen Franklin. Is it possible to highlight multiple MIDI notes and use this scissor tool to split them all at once? Uh, I thought it was possible, but could not figure it out. So let's give it a shot. Right, so it's just All right, so let's All right, so if I wanted to come here and split these notes, um, I'm just gonna set my snap off and I'm gonna hold down the Alt key, I think. So 
that the alt key might do it. Uh, let me try some different shortcut combinations. Yes, I don't know a way of doing it with the scissors tool, but let's see if maybe if we could do it maybe in a logical editor. Yeah, so I think you might have to do each one. Um, I could play around with that, Kai, if you want to send me an email, I'll see if there's some other trick uh, to maybe do that. Let me just look at one other. Let's see if there's maybe a macro approach. So you could kind of, you know, if you wanted to kind of nudge, um, you know, you could do kind of a macro. So let's say if you move your playhead position, and I know this isn't, um, so let's say if I'm here and if I wanted to split, uh, let's say if I want, and I know this may not work for, your particular needs, but let's let's see if we can make a macro maybe to speed this up. Let's just see if we could get this going quickly.
Excuse me. Get some drink. Let's see if this will do it. I may have to work on this and yeah. <clears throat> I'll do a little more playing around with that guy. If you want to send me just a brain cramp reminder email, we could do it for uh, next Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that. That would be kind of like a shift type of function. All right, great to see JVI in the live stream. Okay, reading through comments. Right. Okay, so it just says, uh, hi everyone. When I use monitoring with my guitar, I can barely hear myself playing. Any ideas? Um, so this could really depend on your audio interface. If it's like a two in, two out interface without DSP, you may have like a little monitoring knob. And we see this on like our original UR22s where you have just a knob. Uh, that goes to the middle. So depending upon the position of that knob, that allows you to monitor more of the signal coming from the computer versus the input signal. So it could be just like a monitor knob. So if you could let us know what audio interface you have, if, it could be just like a little monitor knob that you may need to adjust on your audio interface. All right, so we have Donald checking in from South Africa. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. Uh, so we have a question. Is it a known issue that Cubase Pro sometimes does not remember when you have made a track sticky uh, visibility to the left or right of the mixing desk? Um, so I haven't run into that, but if you're not familiar with this concept, let's say if we have um, a number of audio tracks for those who aren't familiar with it, maybe other people could comment if they've run into it. Uh, if we click on visibility and then zones, we could anchor a particular tracks. So let's say if I always want the right, uh, the master fader to be on the right hand side regardless. Um, so my projects that I've had set up like that for years, I've never had an issue with. Uh, and if I want it, um, you know, let's say, you know, uh, this particular track to always be anchored to the left that, you know, we could kind of basically create our own split console where we could have tracks automatically on the left or right hand side. So sometimes people can get confused if they set it up here in the lower zone mixer and then they go to the, uh, you know, to the mix console, the large mix console, those zones that are set up are independent. So if you wanted to get a visibility, you could have 
you know, different zones set up in the large full screen mixer versus the lower zone versus mix console two or three. So maybe it's set up in the lower zone and not in the mix, the larger mix console, but those can work independently. So just, just make sure it's not something like that. All right, so I just see I have a big problem with my Groove Agent 5 and Cubase 10 Pro. I have lots of missing files in production grooves and other agents, and I have installed Groove Agent 5 many times over. Please, please help. So check when you come here. You know, you could download a little utility. I think this came around version 10 called the Steinberg Library Manager. So if you come over here, go to the Steinberg Library Manager, and then you can see Groove Agent. And then what you want to do is, you know, make sure that you see all of the content here. Um, and, you know, you could see the exact folder location. If you go click on Details, you could see, you know, all of the different contents as well as their location. So if you, seems like, you know, you're missing some in, you know, particular libraries, you know, go to that folder and then you could right click uh, and then, you know, just say or double click on the .vst sound file and make sure that we have the actual, you know, that that makes its link. Also, you could go into Media Bay and come over here and say, okay, you want to go to VST sound and, you know, if you go to uh, VST Sound, we can say, okay, go to Acoustic Agent, try to right click and just say rescan disc, <coughs> excuse me, for each of the different sound sets and see, and that should make the link for you even on previous versions. So give that a try. All right, so we have a question from uh, Ted Springman. Thanks for joining. Uh, says, can Cubase be set up so that uh, note and CC MIDI data from a single keyboard controller gets translated uh, to 16 hardware since each listening on its own channel? So yeah, we could do that. I'll just do a new project here. I'll add 16 MIDI tracks. And I'll make sure these aren't all going out to my IAC. All right, so now if I wanted to come here, let's place all of these into record. And then I'll play notes. I'll move MIDI CCs. And now we'll look at each of the parts. Sorry, I mean, sometimes 
but it will just record all that data to the 16 different channels. So, and that's really kind of all you have to do is just put it into record. And then we'll see the notes plus the MIDI CCs will all be recorded as kind of normal parts here. Sometimes when I send it to no destination, I get this. So yeah, no problem with that. So if I wanted to look at this one particular part with MIDI CCs, so that's all you have to do is just place them all into record. All right, so just see a question. Let me just see if I could just send a bunch of MIDI data out. I get this sometimes if I have an IAC driver. Let me just see if I can force quit really quickly here. All right. Um, okay, I'm just going to restart my Mac really quickly. Hang on just one second. Just bear with me. I'll be back in just a minute. My Mac with my IT stuff from Yamaha takes a longer time to boot up. I'm going to reboot here quickly. Bear with me just a second. All right, sorry about that. Let me just get this configured here really quickly. I'll do a quick test, make sure everything is coming through. All right, sorry about that. Let All right, just... so audio is coming through, sorry about that. All right, so. All right, so next question we had. Okay, um, so it says Halion always starts with an instrument hexagon. How can I get rid of it so that any project Halion starts with no instrument at all? Okay, so I think. So when you load up Halion, it's gonna go to I'll load up hexagon as a preset. All right, so I think that all you have to do is um, is just to come over here and save. the particular sound as startup. So I think that's all you have to do is just to come over here uh, and save the sound as startup and then it won't load up hexagon for you. So I think that's kind of what I had done in a previous one. So you could just, um, as you wanted to come over here, 
So it's you want to go to. So just try saving. And then like you could just save as default preset. So uh, so just kind of click right here and then you could load up nothing and then just click as save as default preset and then hexagon won't load up. All right, so we just see uh, from Andy Lane, hi, I want a proper sound font player for the next Cubase. Um, so if you do uh, have Halion, Halion will uh, play sound fonts. You know, sound fonts really haven't been as popular for the last 20 years. Um, they're really popular like in the late 90s, uh, but I know there's a lot of content available in sound font format, but Halion can automatically load up sound fonts for you. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there any way to make the marker bar t up at the top of the project window start at zero a few bars into the song? Okay, so let's say I want it to be this to be and I'll just set this, I'll add a ruler track. And let's set this to seconds, all right. Um, so I could just come here and I think we go to project, you could do the set time code uh at cursor so set time code at cursor here and i'll just say let's set this to 0, 0.0 0. point zero let me just 0. 0.0.0 0. and then right there we could just uh so wherever you want it to be at zero just, just move the cursor there and just say set time code cursor at and wherever the cursor position is, so if I want this to be one hour, I could just come right over here, set time code, cursor position at, and you could just type in, so you have your frame, seconds, minutes, hours, so it's like, okay, we want to do one. And now we'll just come here, and then we could start at one hour or whatever that you have. So wherever you have the project cursor, just say set, time code time code at cursor <coughs> and that should do the trick Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a quick way to grab the loop of the independent track length and uh, lay it across the timeline instead of manually going into the region and cutting and copying and pasting? So let's say if I have uh, just a quick loop here. And if I wanted to just take like just a portion of it, I could just use the range selection tool. Or if, if you're in a combined mode here, I could just select from the top. And then, you know, if I wanted to move that or hold down the alt or option key, I could just make a copy. And then if you wanted to duplicate that, so that way you don't actually affect anything. We don't actually, this is all still contiguous. So try using the range selection tool. So again, you could select the range here if you wanted to copy, and then you could just hit Control or Command D and just take the selection and duplicate. So it's a pretty fast way, and the original file is uh, completely intact without using any cuts.
Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, Greg, do you use a rear bus in your project? So if I'm doing something in 5.1, I do, but uh, if I'm just doing stereo, then I, I don't use a rear bus, so. Or if you're, you know, I know many composers will compose in quadraphonic where they have left, right, front and left, right, rear. And they generally don't get to go into the center channel, <coughs> excuse me, where the dialogue is. So, so generally I'm, most of my projects I'm doing, I'm in stereo, uh, but I, I have a 5.1 set up as well. Timeline just jumped to me. All right, so I think I'm close to where I was. All right, so just see, uh, so Ash will send his question with the UF8. All right, so again, yeah, you can send it to Club Cubase at steinberg.de. Okay, so we have a question. Um, can you show examples of navigating through MIDI segments uh, on top of each other, how to grab and cut certain ones? Okay, so I'll just come here and let me just create a quick... All right, so I'll just do a quick audio recording here, or MIDI recording rather. So I'll just kind of do different ranges of notes. And I'll put it into a loop this time, sorry about that. So I have all of these parts and we could, depending on your re MIDI record setup, you know, we could have these be stacked so that everything can show up in lanes automatically. Now, if you have all of these parts that are stacked, we could also just, if you go to the bottom center of the parts, at this point, you could just say, okay, I wanted to play this one. And now I want to play. say the lowest one or the highest one so these are all kind of stacked on top of each other and if I wanted to merge these uh, I could grab the glue tool and just hold down alt or option and now as we play it'll just uh, we could just have them all And all of the parts will be kind of merged in one. So, you know, but try playing around, you know, with this. But, you know, here's a great little tip to navigate between different MIDI parts when they're kind of, or audio parts when they're kind of on top of each other. Just go to the bottom center. So let me know if that works for you.
So we see from JVI, no Friday hangout. Yeah, so in the United States, it is a holiday after Thanksgiving. So we'll be doing the next one on Tuesday. And then we'll do the two-hour live stream and a two-hour Zoom meetup next Tuesday, a week from today. So looking forward to seeing new faces there. And people who have been on the previous Zoom meetups are always really informative and really interesting. All right, so we see, uh, Greg, can I put my own plugins in the Cubase channel strip? So no, it's, you know, the plugins, <coughs> the plugins are really in the channel strip are uh, going to be fixed to those particular plugins. So, so the intention is that way, it's kind of like a channel strip that you would get on a large format console, like an API, an SSL or Neve. Uh, but you could just add all of them to the inserts. All right, so we just see a uh, question. How do I change the scale in very audio that will always be on on A minor, I guess, or M? I, I, so, or, so, you know, if you want it to, like if you're working with very audio, let's just jump over here quickly, show some very audio stuff. You know, the scale will be actually determined by the chord track. So if I wanted to, like in this instance, I have the piano part and I want to go to the piano part and let's set this up. So I'm going to go to the project menu to the chord track and I'll say, let's create the chord symbols. And now when I go into very audio, we could choose to have uh, the chord track so as we look at this we'll go to very audio and then we could colorize based on the chord track so that way the scale is actually derived from the chord track so if it's if this note is out of key uh you're not within a chord or not within the scale be red if it's within the particular key but not in a chord it'll be this this color and if it's in the chord it'll be green so so the scale is really just derived from the chord track for the coloring Uh, so just see a question from Sable Winters. Uh, are we doing Friday stream in Zoom? So I'm going to take the holiday off. So the next live stream will be on Tuesday. So in the United States, I know we have lots of international uh, viewers, but in the United States, it's a holiday. So. All right, so we have a question. Uh, when using a Mackie control fader and uh, making automated volume adjustments in write mode after I finish, Cubase deletes a lot of the dots when I have finished. So this could be uh, just a quick setting. So let's go to your automation panel and you could do this by hitting F6 <clears throat> and under settings, <coughs> excuse me, under settings, we can come right over here and We'll see the um, reduction level. So let's say if I set this to 
that as I do automation, let me just automate the volume here. So if I just kind of go like this, it will then kind of get rid of 50% of the data. So if I do this, we can see lots of dots and then it will get adjusted. So try just setting the reduction level here. So let's say if I set this to 10%, that, uh, I think that's, let me just, yeah, so just try setting uh, the reduction level there and then you could get more dots. So give that a try. Okay, read through comments. Uh, seeing Cubase Junkies who wants to get some uh, Yamaha monitors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so question, before upgrading to 12 Pro, will I have to back up all my saved presets or will Cubase migrate them over? So generally Cubase migrates them over. Uh, if it doesn't, all you need to do is go into your Cubase 11, go to the edit menu and go to profile manager and export your profile and then import it. That would give you just like a data file that you, you could save to a flash drive or somewhere in your computer and then import that into Cubase 12. All right, so we see Pablo is back from dinner. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And again, if you've learned something new, Make sure that you do hit the like button. Okay, we're doing well on time. All right, we see that Gareth has made the live stream, so the whole hot mess contingent is on the live stream. Or was it this point when I was reading? Gareth is very excited that Pablo's on the live stream. Through comments. All right, so I see a question. Um, if you apply processing to those parts you just posted, does it affect the original part? So, you know, if we do offline processing, like the direct, I think this might be in relation to uh, the direct offline processing. So the what that'll do is it'll create a new audio file with all the processing and the original file is always intact. So you can always go back at any time, you know, 10 years later. All right, so we have a question. Does render in place copy the automation over 
uh, or just a WAV file data. So it depends on the settings that you have for the change. So let me just do a new project here real quick, just to show this easily. Okay, so let's say I have this file in here uh, and I just wanted to larger here so it's okay so let's say now I have just a fade out going on okay so now at this point uh, I think if I go to edit I'm going to select the event and we go to edit to render in place let's go to render settings uh, and then I want to come over here and I think if I choose complete signal path that once we do this let me just try that again see if I had it okay so so complete signal path that we will now see the automation automatically carried over. But if I didn't have, if I changed the settings here, and I think I just did channel settings. Sorry, let me just. So say channel settings. That would do it, but I think if we do the the top option, like dry, that that wouldn't carry the automation over. I don't think. Yeah. So, so if you have dry uh, chosen in the settings, then the automation won't. But if you have channel settings carried over, then that will include the automation. So we see Michael Teens has a Marantz power amp used from Led Zeppelin's side fill stage monitors. Now, now he's just bragging. So it sounds like a great setup, Michael. All right, so we have an, another question. So if there is some DC offset or click pop in the crossfade, uh, we'll render in place, copy that. So, you know, it's gonna render it just as is. Um, so if there is a click in the crossfade, you know, in the, if it's a bad crossfade edit that has a click, an audible click that would be carried over because you're telling it to do a, you know, a recreation of that. So it's not gonna automatically fix that, but often you could fix it quite easily uh, by doing a DC offset from the sample editor. So if you go to audio to processes to remove DC offset, and if you zoom in on the sample editor, let's say I'll just come over here, you know, we could just draw out a popper click um, or draw one in right there. But if you're telling it, if you're telling Cubase to uh, to render in place an event that has that, it will render it in place because it's just doing exactly what you want, uh, what you're telling it to do. So it's not gonna selectively fix things uh, without you telling it to.
interesting discussion of old Atari computers. And Gareth with the Vestax, I remember that unit. Used to run by MIDI machine control. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to drag and copy sends from one track to track as you can do with the inserts? Uh, the click all button does not work. So usually, you know, let's say if I will go to a project here, I'll add a send. All right, so let's say I have a, a send on my snare track here. So let's say I just come here and I want it to do And if I wanted other tracks to just follow that like to two guitar parts, I could just come here and since these tracks can just go to descend, I'll just hold down alter option plus shift and send both of them to Excuse me. So now all, any track that you want is going to the same send, so you don't have to really do any, you know, copying because it's going to the same destination. So I can just say hold down alt control or alt option and shift or just turn on quick link. And now I could just turn these on for all of them and turn on. So now my toms will have too much reverb. So that's why it's kind of handled differently because you're not copying an actual part, you're just sending it to the same destination. So that's why the sends and inserts will be different where the inserts are dedicated to the particular channels and the sends are shared between different channels. All right, so we see a question from John Costigan. Um, at what point or point should I check for DC offsets? Uh, so, you know, usually like before I do my final mix down, uh, I will just kind of do, you know, before sending it off, after I do my mix down, maybe uh, pre-mastering is when I would just do a DC offset test. Um, so you don't have to kind of do it throughout the whole thing. You could just kind of catch it at the end. So, um, so it's not like, Often it'll be, you know, you don't have to check throughout a project just, you know, before you send it out for mastering or do something, you know, or at the final stage, check then. It says, uh, John also just says, hope you get well soon. So I feel fine. It's just talking four hours straight, you know, it's hard on the voice. So, but hopefully I'll get some time to rest up over the holiday. So looking forward to that, but I feel fine. Thank you. All right, just reading through all the great comments. Let's see, Ash Rebel Hen Studios just saying thanks for 
your time answering my questions today, Greg. That's so kind. So th that's what we do. Um, you know, and I think that's what makes it such a great uh, community. You know, we just getting people their own questions answered. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, which functions of signal flow comes first, direct offline processing or extension or clip gain? So the clip gain would come first, and I think the uh, direct offline processing and extension, they're not necessarily considered in the signal flow, but are being processed to the audio file. So I think that those would be kind of at the same time, but the direct offline processing, I, you may give an edge to the extension because it will be kind of, you know, affecting it in real time, whereas the direct offline processing is actually, you know, processing the particular file and not just running it through editors, but often the extension is then rendered. All right, so we see John Costigan has a buddy who hopes to do a session at Ocean Way with Leland Sklar and Jim Keltner. So that does mean you're somebody. So I got to meet Jim Keltner at a event he did at Yamaha, mm. just showing, uh, I think, symbols. So that was kind of fun. It's him and Abraham Laboreal. It wasn't a bad afternoon at Yamaha. See, Michael Pierce's producer, he's working for, just swears by Oceanway Nashville. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool studio. It was actually an old church on Music Row that they converted into a studio. It's a nice room, been there many times. Okay, so Jazz Dude is saying we need 100 likes, so please smash the like button if you haven't. All right, so I see we're at 99, so let's right, see how we're doing on time. So I think I may be almost caught up. Okay, so I think I'm caught up, and I know we have a couple of questions that were mailed in advance, so let's go ahead and take a look at them. Sorry. All right. So let's get started. Um, it says, I, I can't use filter automation like a low pass filter straight ramp from 200 hertz to 20 hertz on a two bar long sine synth cord or saw synth cord with a frequency plug in because it sounds grainy and not smooth at all. Um, the issue seems to almost disappear when using a 16 sample buffer size, but I obviously get CPU overload then. Uh, it says I use LFO tool VST2 64-bit instead as a solution. Is there any solution or specific settings to apply to solve this problem? Um, and this is from uh, Nicholas Dubois. So let's take a look. I think I may have kind of a project set up for this. All right, so let's say if I have just kind of like a synth sound here. Okay, so let's say. So I think, you know, one of the 
you know, a great tool for this, you know, that you may want to utilize instead of an EQ is maybe just kind of, you know, I would try maybe a filter plugin. So let's say if I come here, like the dual filter plugin. So let's say if I just wanted to, uh, let's say we'll listen to this. So, and let's say if I just wanted to take this sounding. So, you know, instead of utilizing an EQ and while an EQ could be a filter, but you know, it's probably just being able to utilize, you know, something very easily like a dual filter. And you could, of course, just kind of automate that particular parameter. So let's say we'll show that automation slot and let's go ahead and just kind of draw in automation. You know, we could just now come right over here and just. So, uh, so if that's kind of what you want to do, maybe check out, you know, and you could see this plugin under, uh, under the dual filter. So if you go under the filter section, just come right over here and then you get to see dual filter and there's also morphing filters. So, you know, this may be kind of more, you know, more appropriate filtering tools for what you want to do, but let me know if I misunderstood. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to create random modulation on an automation track? Uh, not MIDI CC, it would be kind of like a sample and hold. Um, so, you know, you can kind of do this with the auto LFO tool. So let me just uh, open up a particular project. Maybe I'd do just a little bit of tweaking. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to come over here and I had um, just different LFOs. So let's say I have just like, like a really boring part. So often we use LFOs to kind of change particular sounds. So I could do it in instruments. So if I wanted to look at this instrument, I could say, let's come over here to my MIDI inserts. And I would say, okay, let's take this really boring pad and I wanted to do panning. So we could set up an auto LFO to adjust the panning. And then if I wanted to do kind of like volume changes, And let's say now we'll do this with our synth, like the bass. So if I wanted this to do kind of like a wobble, I could come over here to this LFO and I'm just gonna adjust the cutoff. And let's say I have just drums and I wanted to kind of do this to control maybe like the position of the filter to, you know, have that playback. So at this point, I could create a track 
and I'm just gonna create a MIDI track here. And we could have a loopback, which is just a little utility you could download and install it if you have, uh, if you're running Mac, you could do it through IAC. And let's go to the studio setup and I'm gonna just add a generic remote control. And what I want to do is just set this to my IAC bus, my loopback. And this is a way of sending MIDI data within the program. And I want to just come over here and I have this MIDI track here. This MIDI track will be routed out to the IAC bus. And when I go to the generic remote setup, what we want to do is to just do a MIDI learn. So as we play, we could basically have this particular MIDI uh, part. So I'm gonna click on learn here. So this LFO plugin is gonna send that MIDI information. And what I want it to do is to take that particular setup and I'm gonna go over here to, uh, to the mixer and we'll go to uh, the particular channel So this will be our glitch drums track. All right, so. All right, so I'm gonna take this track and then I want it to go to uh, my inserts and then we'll go to our dual filter and then we'll have it adjust the position. So now when I come over here, we could have this particular LFO just automatically adjusting this and you could adjust kind of, you know, the time positions if you didn't want it to be synced. So this way you could have like, if you have, you know, automation that isn't being controlled, you could just come over here and kind of have that randomly controlled. So try experimenting with some of the LFOs with the loopback. All right, so we had a question. Uh, how to copy channel settings from one channel to multiple channels at the same time? Okay, so let's jump back to a different project. Okay, so let's say I have like an insert on a number of tracks, so let's say Okay, so let's say I have these uh, inserts and I wanted to copy these channel settings from this track to a number of tracks that are selected. So if we right click on the bottom of the channel name in the mix console, we can come over here and we'll see this uh, copy first selected channel settings. And now I'm going to select a number of channels here in my mix console. Now I could right click and I'll say paste settings to selected channels and then those will automatically kind of be carried over that way. So try right clicking to uh, copy the first channel settings and then pasting to the selected channels. Give that a shot.
All right, next question. Uh, could we have frequency to replace the default channel EQ and also be visible in the mixer EQ window? Um, so, you know, when we do this, if we wanted to see uh, the frequency EQ here, you know, there's, you know, probably billions of Cubase projects that, you know, are utilizing the older, uh, you know, the, the standard channel EQ. Um, so we don't want to necessarily change the default EQ settings across all of the different channels to a new algorithm. You know, we have a lot of customers who would be unhappy about that. Um, but I'll pass it along as a suggestion. I know it's been sent in before. Um, but you know, even though the, the frequency EQ is fabulous, don't underestimate this, you know, like Elliot Shiner, this is, you know, he's probably one of the most, you know, prominent mixing engineers in the world. This is still his favorite, uh, EQ that he works with is just the built-in channel EQ. All right. Uh, another question that was sent in, um, are you working on something like continuous play in other programs? So I tried to get uh, an idea what this was. Um, so I was just wondering uh, if continuous play is maybe what we call a stationary cursor. So let's say as we're playing, so let's say I'll just choose to follow that this, that my timeline continuously plays, um, if that's what is meant by continuous play, so as opposed to redrawing at the end where the it's constantly visually playing and the, and the cursor is staying at the same position, I, I didn't get a confirmation back before the live stream. Uh, but let me know if that's it. If that's what you want to do, just, you know, come over here and just enable stationary cursor and give that a try. All right. So that was the questions that were sent in. Let me go back to our chat. Uh, just want to thank, let's see how we're doing. Get the same position. All right. Uh, let me just... Come back over here. All right, hang on one second. My son is knocking. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, why is supervision always on? So I like to have supervision on in my control room. So at this point, I could just kind of jump uh, to see what's going on in my control room uh, monitoring path. So that's kind of what I usually do. Um, so I just have my control room. I have that set up. So if that's why you see it in the control room, just so that I could always have it available. You see Michael Pierce just saying it was hilarious thinking he was sitting in our little room. He's been doing gospel out there. Yeah, I mean, the church, the uh, Ocean Way is kind of a ridiculous studio, but I mean, it's it's kind of a, a classic, you know, Nashville church that got turned into a studio, but it's mostly being utilized for, uh, I think Belmont owns the studio. So it's a way to get Belmont students kind of involved and do internships at a real studio.
Okay, reading through comments here. All right, so we see a question. Uh, MIDI presets are empty menu in Cubase 11. How do I fix it? So I assume that this is going to be, is this in the MIDI uh, logical presets? Um, so if you come over here, if you have a previous version, you, you can um, not go to your web browser, but sorry about that. All right, but if we come over to, um, let's say your finder. So if you're on the Windows platform, you could go to your start menu, go to all programs, go to Steinberg Cubase 11. Don't start the program from the little start menu or whatever they call it in Windows 10, but you'll see a user settings and data folder underneath that, open that up on a Mac. We would go to the library to preferences. And if you're on a Mac, you may have to hold down the uh, option key. Apple is too afraid you might find your preference folder. So then it's a little trick they do. So we'll come over here to library and go to preferences. So if you have it, if you have it on a previous version, you can Come over here, you'll see a Cubase folder. And then you'll see presets. And in here, you'll see the logical editor presets. So you could just go to the Cubase 10.5, copy all these logical editor presets over, and then drag it into the Cubase 11 and that should uh, take care of it for you. You could also try save, exporting a profile from the edit menu in Cubase. I believe it's gonna be carried over that way as well. So if you go to your profile manager, export a profile and then import that profile into version 11. All right, so we see a question. Uh, is there a way to make a mono track into a stereo track? So, you know, generally they're going to be mono or stereo. Um, but what you could do, like if you wanted to do it for like an effects is, you know, you could add an, an effects channel to the selected tracks and then you could add a stereo uh, like if you wanted to add a stereo delay, you could do that. You could also just send it to uh, a group channel if you needed to do it for routing. So if you wanted to send that to a group, um, and if you wanted to make a mono channel sound wider, if it's just for a sonic, uh, type of thing, go to an insert and you could go to under spatial and panner just come here and go to stereo enhancer and you can make it sound wider more stereo or if it's a stereo track you want to sound more mono you could just go down to zero percent for that so those are a couple of options but just kind of for signal flow routing you know mono and stereo tracks just like they are in consoles will be treated a bit differently All right, so we have a question. Uh, what is the easiest way to insert two bars into the middle of a large project so that one does not ruin automation and two splits the wave files? Okay, so let's look at this project here. I'll revert it quickly. Okay, so let's say I wanted to add, I'll just hide the lower zone, uh, two measures starting at measure 25. So. I will come over here. I'm just going to select kind of my range 
And if I wanted to do this globally, I think it's uh, control shift. So, or control or command plus shift. So, and let's say I had automation going on here. So, all right, you may hear my son playing, He's figuring out cartoon themes in the background on the piano. All right, so let's say I wanted. So I have this range selected. So what I could do is go to my edit menu to range, and then we're gonna say insert silence. And then it will just move everything over set by the amount defined in the range time. And as you can see, the automation is carried over. So if I undo, redo, we could just see that effect right there. So select kind of the range and you do control or command plus shift or uh, just globally kind of select the range like that. And then once again, go to edit to range to insert silence. And then it will give you that space and move over the automation and splits the wave files. See kind words from Sable, just saying take care of myself this week. So yeah, I've been resting a lot. So, but looking forward to having a couple of days off. But thank you, Sable. All right, so we just see, uh, Greg, it could be so cool to have the native instrument complete control S49 slash S61 use chord track scale value without having to have complete loaded on the track. So, you know, you could do it with any MIDI controller. So, you know, if it's a function of, I don't have the native instruments controllers, um, but, you know, for the particular tracks, you know, you could come over here. There's a number of ways of doing it. You could go into... Uh, like for a MIDI track. So let's say if I come here, you know, you could just say, okay, I want it to be global. Uh, and I only want it to filter notes. So, and at this point I could just say where value one is set to a fixed scale and I could say, okay, let's make it, you know, C1. And at that point, you know, we could just come right over here and, you know, let's say, or let's, let's say we'll just set this to C, uh, I'll, I'll set it to transpose to scale rather. So. I can say, okay, I only want every note that I play to play in D major. And we could just set that up there. We could also do within the MIDI editor, we could do a snap to scale as well. So let's say if we have our MIDI events, we could just say snap live input to the particular scale. We could do it based on the chord track or based directly from the scale that we have defined here. So if I say I only want it to snap to my live input to the key of F. So you could do it without having the complete, you know, or any of the software for the controller uh, activated in a couple of different ways. All right, so we have a question. Is there a way to stop the loop feature activating when clicking on the top bar window? It can be annoying. So when we come over here, we could you know turn on and off the loop. So a lot of people wanted the ability to never have that. 
So let's find, there is a preference for this. Uh, so let me see if it's, Just it's gonna be under editing. I think um, okay, so if you go to transport. So go to preferences to transport and then so you'll see a preference clicking locator range in upper part of the ruler activate cycle. Uncheck that. And now when you do this, you can't uh, turn that on or off by clicking. So, but if you wanted that on, go to uh, preferences and go to transport and you'll see clicking locator range in the upper part of the ruler activate cycle. So you could activate and deactivate that particular function right there with that preference. See, Michael Pierce has no questions this week. He says he spent a weekend in Pro Tools and it hurt his head. Do you have a solution for that? It's like, just use Cubase. It's great. All right, so we see question, um, how do I, scrub tool, how do I work with it? All right, so if we have the play tool active, I can just kind of play different parts. And if I wanted to switch to the scrub tool, I can now. And when we do this, this gets routed through the control room. So if you don't hear it, try going to your studio, to audio connections, and make sure that you have the control room activated and the settings set right there. All right, I'm just going to, my son's knocking on the door. Give me one second. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. All right, uh, so I just see, but I can't turn uh, supervision off of my control room. Is that supposed to be that way? So if you just, so let's say if we open this up and we bypass, we turn the plugin off, we could, you know, so try just opening up the plugin and then you could turn off the power to the particular plugin. Let's see if there's maybe you have to hold down alt. So try holding down alt or option, and then you could turn it off in the control room right there. All right, so we see, uh, Greg, why do deactivated plugins uh, still cause a delay? Is there a way to to circumvent this other than clicking the delay compensation button. The delay compensation button will, you know, basically be the fastest way of doing that. Uh, but let's say if I go to my mix console and we'll look at the uh, channel latency settings. So let's say I'll just add a couple of latent plugins here.
Okay, so we look at our channel latency now, we're at 246 milliseconds. Um, all right, so if we come over here and bypass the plugins, you know, so there's a difference here. If we bypass the plugins, they're still taking the latency so that you could turn it off and on really quickly. But I think if we hold down, um, All right, let me see if there's a... But there's a way to, <clears throat> instead of bypassing, to deactivate. I'm trying to remember what the keyboard shortcut is here. So let's see if I come over here to... Trying to remember what the function is off the top of my head. I'm just having kind of a brain cramp with that. Um, maybe it's on the inspector here. Okay, so So I'm just forgetting what the, uh, but there's a way to bypass, which would, you know, deactivate the plugins and turn off the, and minimize the latency. I'm just forgetting what the keyboard shortcut to do that globally is. Um, but the quickest way is just to, you know, if you come over here, that would do it, and that would do it globally for all the tracks, minimizing your latency. And the reason they make that distinction is that, you know, you may want the plugin to turn on and off uh, without having the latency to be reset during the, the playdown process. You could turn the plugin on without any interruptions or hiccups. Okay, so we just see a question. Uh, sometimes when resizing multiple tracks, the speed of the resize can take off and become massive. So I haven't really had many problems with this. So let's say I select a number of tracks uh, and then, you know, if you wanted just to hold down, like, you know, the control key, you could just, you know, come right over here and just kind of resize pretty efficiently. I think so, you know, give that a try, just, you know, selecting the tracks and then adjust one down while holding down a control key. And that will do it kind of globally for all the tracks. So we see Michael Pierce and I think it's about Oshaway, Nashville. Oh, so that's really cool. A school, a school owns such an amazing studio. I can't imagine the course prices. I think it was basically the studio may have needed some financial assistance and figured it was a good way to get uh, interns that they wouldn't have to pay. So it worked, worked out well. And it looks like a really cool thing for the school. It's like, hey, look, you could work here. It's a, it's a great thing for parents to see.
Okay, so we just see, um, how do I color the fader paths like the tracks? So when I see kind of my mixer here, we can see that these will be colored using kind of the colors from the tracks. And this is gonna be a preference. So go to uh, preferences, you wanna go under user interface to track and mix console channel colors. And here you can see this preference for mixed console channels. So I'm gonna uncheck that and we'll see that this is how previous versions were. And now when I activate this and we could set color strength and intensity and brightness, and then I could just hit okay. And that will now colorize based on the track colors, the mix console. All right, so we see a couple of people didn't know about the inserting silence with the range tool. All right, you see Nick has to head off a little early. All right, question from Gareth. I don't know if this is just in my imagination, but is it possible to make the color palette floating and permanently open? So I think if you hit Alt Control C, no, it's not that, Alt Control S. Let me, if we just come over here, let's go to the project. Um, so I think Command Shift S, let me see if that's it. No, I may have remapped. that now if we have uh, like the color palette set up that this can, uh, let me just, So I think if we just do the project color setup. Just see if there's, I thought that there was like a little floating Just take a look again here. Let me look in the key commands because I think there is maybe like a floating. Okay, so if you hit uh, option or alt or option plus shift plus C, then you could have your floating color temp, your floating color palette visible. So, so again, uh, alt or option plus shift plus the letter C, and then you could have that as a floating window if I don't hit the wrong keyboard shortcut again. So do that, Gareth. That should do the trick. All right, so we have a question. Uh, how can I recolor multiple tracks when selecting multiple tracks and using the color tool in the inspector It only colors one track? So all you have to do is just select your multiple colors here. You could now click on the um, 
make sure that you don't have like an event selected. So let's say if I have all these tracks selected, I can now pick a color and they will go, or I could just come, if I have this closed, I could say all these tracks are selected, go to the color tool and just select a color just like that. And you could colorize multiple events just like that. But make sure if you have an event selected, the event will get the priority. So if we come here, this event is selected. I have that and I recolor just that event is selected and not the parts. But if the tracks, just that event is selected. But if only at the track level is selected, then we could recolorize all of the selected events using the color tool right here. All right, thanks for all the great questions. Be a long index tonight, I think. All right, so we have a question. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between automation and mixed snapshots? So, you know, the mixed snapshots don't include automation. So, you know, and, you know, because obviously automation is going to be a dynamic event that evolves over time. And a snapshot is really intended just to have all of the settings uh, set, you know, and recalled. So a lot of times people may use like I may start a project before I have a lot of automation. And you know, one of the things that's always really handy that I missed from kind of old, you know, old school mixing is maybe you kind of start a mix and you're getting the static values set. Uh, and then let's say everything you did was, you know, you're listening to it and you know, at this point you hate every single thing that you just did. So you may say, okay, but there could be something redeeming. And now at this point, I could say, I wanted to take all these tracks and start over and I'll link these and say, okay, I'm going to build a mix from scratch again. So I build another mix from scratch. All right. And let's say, okay, this is my perfect automation mix. So now I could say, okay, what was my first stab at doing this and I could recall that and okay, maybe I want to listen to mix snapshot two. Okay. So you can say, wow, I really like the guitars of mix snapshot two, but I wanted to take the drums from mix snapshot four. So I could take the selected channels, come over here and let's do the recall. So I can say, we're going to do selected channels. And I just wanted to do the pre, the inserts, the EQ, but not the channel strip. And I wanted to recall from track snapshot four. So I could just come right over here and that would do that, but not affect the other channels. So since this is like a still image, it's not going to include dynamic events like automation. So when I'm using mixed snapshots, I kind of do it before there's a lot of automation going on and then have all these decisions made and then automate. But the mixed snapshots, you know, think of a still picture, not playing back a movie is, you know, and that's how it, how it is. So kind of use it for like traditional workflows that many analog engineers have done over the years. Reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussion.
see Michael Pierce saying he loves it. My son's playing cartoon themes. Uh, when he plays The Simpsons, we're all in trouble. So I don't think my wife wants him to see The Simpsons yet. So he might be a little irreverent for his age, but uh, I, I like it. Uh, but he could probably, he's pretty good at hearing something and being able to pick it out in the right key. So he could be, I mean, I think he could probably do The Simpsons if he heard it. So. And sometimes it's interesting. He'll look at the keyboard or look at a guitar for a couple of minutes and then he'll pick the first right note and it'll be like the right note in the key of the piece he heard. So it's interesting to watch. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussion. You get to see all these cool revelation, amazing, and then I'm so delayed I don't know what it was. So. See John Koskin saying when I showed him insert silence with the range selection, his hair started to grow back. So that's good. Merry Christmas. All right, he said, just saying a comment on the coloring, but you can't change the color of multiple tracks using the color options in the inspector. So when you're doing it from the inspector, the inspector is only for that particular selected track. So it's one, you know, you may have multiple tracks selected, but it's only one inspector. So that's why the coloring is only for one track at a time from the inspector. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to don't accidentally click on the mixer and change a fader and settings. Um, if you do, you know, there's a separate undo history for the mixer. If you just kind of click here, so let's say, okay, you know, I did three bad moves when I was just accidentally moving. You see this undo history for the mix console. So you could just come right over here and have an independent, you know, undo history for the mixer. So even if I'm in the larger mix console, um, you know, I could see, okay, I move this, adjust this, I adjust the pan, I adjust an EQ, I adjust a plug-in parameter. All these can be stored in their own, uh, you know, mix console history. So it's an undo history for everything in the mixer. So you could always do that.
Let's see how we're doing. We have about three or four minutes left. All right, so I think I'm at the end of the questions. Uh, I see nice well wishes from Michael Pierce. Thanks. And look forward to hopefully everyone can make it to uh, next Tuesday's Zoom. I'll try to get someone lined up, an interesting guest that could share some unique insights. Uh, but we'll just wait another minute and see if anything else uh, comes in. And I know there's usually a little bit of latency, but we'll just kind of wait and we'll I want to thank everyone for joining from all over the world. Uh, so once again, no live stream on Friday as it's a holiday in the United States, but Tuesday we'll be doing it. And then we'll do two hours and then a two-hour Zoom meetup. So we look forward to seeing everyone on the Zoom. And with that, we'll give it another 30 seconds or so, see if there's any last-minute questions. And it's great to see new users on the live stream and many people that are uh, loyal attendees. It's always great and it's a wonderful thrill for, be able, for me to be able to help people and share some tips and tricks. And I always feel good if I get a revelation for some people. So, all right. And with that, I will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone. If you're in the United States, have a wonderful holiday celebration. Check uh, the Steinberg site in the next couple of days. There might be some exciting stuff going on this time of year. So uh, please check that out and take advantage of some of the opportunities that will be available. All right. So with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much. And everyone have a great holiday weekend if you're celebrating Thanksgiving in the United States. And we'll see everyone back on Tuesday.